First, I'd like to thank the organizer, uh, CLC, for the opportunity to sh share my research on uh, urban complex system. So my name is Lok Yu. I'm uh, actually a physicist working in a uh, School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences in NTU. Um, a colleague of uh, Siwan, who just given a talk, both of us work in complex system. So my purpose today is to introduce uh, how complexity science can be applied to urban system, especially viewing urban system as a complex system. And specifically, uh, I would talk about uh, how it is being applied in the sense of using methods of complex system as well as uh, models. So in a way, how complexity can be useful, perhaps for urban planning uh, and urban modeling and so on and so forth. So it could be relevant to what you are doing. So first, uh, let me motivate uh, why do we feel an urban system to be like a complex system. So first of all, we see that an uh, urban system uh, is not isolated. It is a, not a closed system. It is connected uh, to the external world where inputs are given to the system and the system itself produces output. For example, economic outputs, and there are a lot of social economic interaction within it, which actually uh, make it very much dynamic. And in fact, that dynamism is linked to other urban system or other cities in the world. Especially now with the globalization, you see that the connectedness becomes stronger and stronger. So in a complex system point of view, is that a city, which is an urban system, have a lot of interaction. There's a lot of connection. So this is the perspective of uh, why a city should be viewed as a complex system. It is not independent, right? Uh, but in the next new slide, next few slides, I will uh, talk about this point more and more, um, especially the concept of how complex system is relevant. But for that, I would like to relate it to something maybe uh, maybe also familiar to you, which is biological system. So that's why I call it urban organism. In fact, a city itself, you can also perceive it as some sort of biological organism. Yeah. But oftentimes you see that, well, a city is planned top down, right? So there would, of course, be a top down perspective. But more and more important now that the researchers or scientists are recognizing is that there's something that is bottom up, uh, where it comes from many, many agents or people making individual decisions, and that decisions actually can have global impact. So that is where the concept of emergence, what that uh, Siwan mentioned just now, it comes out from this bottom up social interaction. And that is the part that link it to complexity, yeah. which top down, you find yourself not able to control it. So there is something that is, uh, I would say, un unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. And in, in many ways, cities are like biological organism than just a simple mechanical system. Why? Because they also exhibit adaptive properties. Assist the city, for example, especially later when I talk about how we respond to COVID-19, you see how each city is very adaptive in when the pandemic occurs and how they um, devise immediately policies and approach to overcome it. So essentially, this adaptive properties is required to compete and survive, just like a biological organism, because resources are always limited. So how do you exploit the limited resources so as to out-compete and out-survive in this world? So that is basically why a complexity uh, perspective is important. Now, there are many evidential uh, circumstances that you can see that uh, this science itself is not just talking. In fact, there are evidence that complexity is working uh, in the urban system. A very clear example is 
This is a leaf network, a vascular network from the leaf, where water are distributed to different parts of the cells of a, a leaf. And here itself is a city of Chile, where you can see the road networks are uh, intertwined, and then vehicles are go on to different parts of the city and different houses. So this is basically, you can see essentially, the similarity, a distribution network. The resource is limited. The land area is limited. But how can you efficiently distribute the resources to the different part of the area? So both the leaf network and the Chile City network actually exploit this fractal feature of the transportation network right? to make efficient use of the scarce resources for distribution. So you can see that there is at present, this fractal geometry that is present in cities. And that's why you see that the new science of cities talk a lot about scaling properties. The scaling properties actually comes from uh, this sort of fractal feature where N, for example, is some measurement unit, epsilon is some scaling factor, and D itself, we call it a fractal dimension. In fact, it is a the, 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 sometimes you call it the power law, right? the exponent of the power law. So why cities exhibit such power law has something to do with the aspect of trying to exploit the limited resources efficiently. Okay? And this analogy between uh, biological system and city system actually is very fruitful, especially now when we go on to look deeper into this scaling theory. Um, research has found that uh, in biology, there is this famous allometric scaling law. It has been known a long time ago that many of the biological processes actually follow some sort of scaling. Well, I pick up the one that is most famous. The most famous one is the relation between body, body mass and metabolic rate, and it is scaled with a power of three quarter. And this Underlying meaning of this allometric scaling law is a sort of economy of scale that a biological organism somehow spontaneously develops within it so as to make full use of the limited resources within our body because we also need to survive, in a sense, our cells somehow through evolution uh, that the system scale, our body system scale in this way. And in fact, this scaling law has a very, very interesting implication which can be when we put in the context of rates of resource consumption, means that you divide the, the metabolic rate with the mass, right? This B over M, this equation can be easily converted to this B over M proportional to M to the power alpha minus one. So it's a simple division. And you put the three quarter here, which is from there, you see that this exponent now is less than um, zero, okay? So alpha minus one is less than zero. So what does this mean? Here itself is the implication. So this is, a, uh, uh, the, the y-axis is related to this B over M. In fact, um, this is heart rate, right? The heart rate itself, somehow they, they relate it to the B over M. And this is the size of the animal or mammals, okay? In other words, when the size is small, the heart rate is faster. The size is large, the heart rate is slower. So for example, a mouse would have a faster heart rate than a human. Elephant would be, have even a slower heart rate than us because it, their size is bigger. So what does that mean? It means that for them, I mean for a small uh, mouse, right, the pace of life right, actually is fast. But as the size becomes bigger and bigger, the pace of life actually reduces. Okay, so, right, so therefore, that is the implication for biological system. And interestingly, right, we know just now that city, in a, in a way, also follow some sort of allometric scaling law. So a researcher has um, looked at empirical data and they plot and they find that, oh, actually, consistently, there's a lot of power law behavior with many exponents. And based on those data, they have also plotted relation that relate to this, B over M proportional to M alpha minus one. 
And for us in the, in the urban, urban society, in fact, this alpha minus one is greater than zero. So our life is opposite to, to that, that biological system. The pace of life actually increases with increasing size. Means that you go to a larger and larger urban system, the pace of life becomes faster and faster and faster. It's more and more stressful. So that is the consequence. And, but why is that so? There's something that we can learn from this. Is that this increasing pace of life in cities actually comes about from social currencies. Because in cities, there's information, there's innovation, and there's wealth. So all these things that is driving the people in the city. And that actually increases that pace of life. So that is the consequence. And this actually arises from what we call the increasing returns with population size. And therefore, you can see that in cities, we need to understand that it is driven a lot by social interactions, and especially interactions between human and built environment. So that is the, the key thing that we need to understand. Is when we look at cities or urban system, how the urban system is affecting us and how we are affecting the urban system and how we, in fact, interact with each other. So that is actually a key aspect of a city. Okay? So that, I mean, this, all these empirical results points to this direction. So here itself, you see that sort of social interaction leads to emergent and self-organized behavior. So here itself, I just show that uh, this is an urban rooftop uh, farm, uh, garden. Actually, it's in the, uh, you guess where this, this one is? You, yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's Tamasat University in Bangkok. Yeah. So this is the biggest uh, uh, urban food farm in uh, Asia, within Asia. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just, well, evolved with the, uh, emerge out from that uh, willing, I mean, wanting to, to have sustainable practice, right? But there is also other type of uh, emergence. For, for example, the slums, here is in Mumbai, right? Uh, so things that self organize into this form, of course, there could be some sort of top-down planning at work as well. But basically, is that the system actually adaptive. So, so you see that, well, Many times when things are trying to plan, but there could be some sort of organic forces that's working that lead to a phenomena that you cannot actually uh, predict. So, so here itself, let, let me go, go through a bit of what is complex system. So Chiwan has talked about it, so I, I just maybe repeat a bit yeah, on it. So this is a point of view from a physics point of view, because you know, physicists always try to quantify things and try to make prediction. So therefore, we take complex system as a science that we can make quantitative, predictive, and experimental, testable science, where now the matter which we use to study is like electron, proton, or molecules, go on to maybe humans, in fact, even. And also interactions that is just not electromagnetic force and nuclear force, but also social forces, maybe. Yeah. So how do we uh, apply the type of thinking that we do as physicists into a complex system. That is the goal. And one thing we learn about complex system is that there is a lot of feedback. There's also positive feedback or negative feedback, and those are very, very important. And the study of feedback dates back to cybernetics, where uh, Norbert Wiener talked about scientific study of control and communications in animal and machine. Okay? So that is um, you know, very much focus uh, on one aspect, but now, right, we are trying to understand how such control and communication may be working within a city or between groups of people. So that is something that is more challenging. But basically, the idea is this. Feedback is such that um, from a mechanical and point of view, there could be some signal that comes in, go to some controller, uh, then go to controlling some other system, and then there's feedback. So the, Simplest example would be the air conditioning. You want to control the temperature to be at, let's say, for some 22, 22 degrees Celsius in this room. So there's some deviation, means it becomes hotter. The motor comes in to drive it to cool it down, right? So that is the sensor comes in, 
control this controller, cool it down, and then feedback, things is are fine. If not, then it will drive again. So that is what we call negative feedback. Things always stabilize. But there is also positive feedback where things actually not just cancel out, but actually amplify. So for example, if I'm successful, I become more motivated. I become more motivated, I become even more successful and more motivated. So that's a positive feedback. I become better and better. Or I become depressed, I become, do worse. I do worse, I become even more depressed. I do worse and worse. That's a vicious cycle. So there's a virtual cycle and vicious cycle. So those are feedback. Now these feedback processes happen in cities, in biological processes as well. In our protein networks, in our body, there's also this positive and negative feedback that is balancing our biological processes. And I believe it's also happening in the city. And that actually was one important aspect of complex system. And yes, I think she want to talk about simple, complicated, and complex system. So again, I just repeat it. Yeah, so the car is a complicated system. So uh, in this case, it's a human crowd. So I, I, I use an example of a horse. Yeah. So um, why, why I use a horse is that um, if you drive a car from point A to point B, I mean, yeah, you, 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 more or less you know that you will reach it, you know. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, pretty confident, right? Nothing will go wrong, yeah. Uh, I think 100 times you drive, 100 times you reach it. But imagine that this horse is a wild horse, not, not a tame horse. Then you want to go from point A to point B, maybe you may consider whether you could reach it or maybe in between this horse may have some behavior that you cannot control. So therefore, this is like a complex system in that sense. Uh, yeah. So there are many truisms of complex system. Um, these are a list, a list that I got it from the book by Caroline Weissner. Yeah. So uh, basically, more is different. Um, Non-living system can generate order, and complexity can come from simplicity. So this is very subtle. A lot of times we think that things complex means think things are more complex. Actually, it's very simple thing can become very complicated. Um, coordinate behavior doesn't does not come from an overall controller. There's no leadership. Just a flock of birds that fly in the sky. There's no leader, but there's some very interesting emergent pattern. Complex system are um, often modeled as networks or information processes. That's information processing inside a complex system. Very important. So that, that makes complex system actually some sort of, some looks intelligent in, even sometimes. There are various kinds of environments and forms of universal behavior in complex system. Yeah, they, this, what, this is what makes complex system uh, science possible because with this, then there's possibility to study it. Yeah, and something interesting. Complexity science is computational and probabilistic. You can understand this why? Because before we have a computer, yeah, pe no people study compute complex system because there's no means to study it. And probabilistic because it is too complex. So therefore, you need statistics, uh, yeah, probability theory to um, describe it. And therefore, you know that there will be always be uncertainty because of the probabilistic description. And complexity science involves multiple disciplines. So this is where all of us learn how to interact with different people uh, as you do the research. Um, and it's something that is very interesting because we learn something new from different parties in that sense. There's a difference between the order that complex system produce and the order of the complex system themselves. So this is also another aspect of the scaling that you talk about and also the hierarchy. There's always hierarchical structure within complex system. So, so there are also what we call features of complex system, which are summarized in, in this way. Uh, numerosity means there are many, many bodies in the system. There's always disorder and diversity. There's feedback, as I mentioned. The system is not in equilibrium. So in economics, you think that the economic system is equilibrium. But in fact, in the real economic system, it's not actually in equilibrium. And the city is never in equilibrium. Spontaneous order and self-organization. So this is some, always like a trademark of a complex system where the system self-organizes itself. Non-linearity, so that you does not just see, see, you may see chaos because chaos comes from non-linearity and things don't just add up. So the 
Who is greater than some of the parts also come from that. Robustness. So this is important. A complex system somehow learn to uh, adapt itself to, so that it's robust. When small perturbation comes, it can, yeah, it can still survive because of the redundancy that comes along with it. Yeah. Nested structure and modularity. So here is the hierarchy that I talked about. History and memory. So this is what you want to talk about. is the cultural heritage. So a cultural system would be complex because, well, that itself, you, you, the, 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 the place that you have actually retain a memory, right? So, yeah, so therefore, the complexity comes in when you talk about cultural heritage and adaptive behavior. How do we adapt to it? So I hope this gives you a picture of what complex system is uh, in a very generic way. Um, so now, I, with that feeling, then now you see the effect, okay? The effect of complexity comes with this word called emergence. This emergence is a term that is somehow that you can resonate within yourself. You can feel what it is, but it's very difficult to describe. So I hope the pictures can speak a thousand words. Yeah, so, soap bubble, right? You cannot really tell, you know, the, every time you make a soap bubble, bubble, the pattern will be different, okay? So, so it just emerge out. A tornado, it just emerge out from the fluid mechanical system that uh, within the atmosphere. And this is definitely surprising, right? How do you expect an ant to know how to form a bridge and so that the ant can cross over and no need to go down the tree and go to the other side? So, so it just emerge from the interaction between the ants. Yeah. So this is a classic example of what emergence is. How to see this is this. Look carefully. Each one is a circle, and actually it's just every ball is just going around a circle, okay? Individually. But collectively, you see that it is a wave, okay? So the wave emerge out of the microscopic uh, movement, okay? So this is another way to see what emergence is, right? Okay, so I, I hope this gives you a sense of uh, complex system. And now, with this sense of what complex system is and complex science, can it be useful? Can, be, can it serve some purpose? So the, the aim of my talk is to show that it can. Yeah. So to do that, um, I need to introduce two keywords, which is part of the title of my talk is uh, methods. So to make it fruitful, we need to use it. And how do we use it is to create method, which is a systematic or established procedure that achieves some function or purpose when we uh, uh, use some method. And then next is that ultimately, uh, while we, the method can achieve some purpose, but there's a bigger goal. The bigger goal is that we want to construct a model that uh, is some sort of representation that replicates what it looks like or how it works. In other words, what I try to say is that this model is maybe a model of some complex system, maybe a traffic system or maybe an urban system or something so that we can use it uh, or the government can use it or the agency can use it perhaps to do maybe prediction, projection and so on and so forth. So the idea here is we know that uh, certain systems are complex. So can we create a model of that complex system using methods as scaffold? So that is what I aim to um, talk about today. So um, to do that, let me just introduce some very uh, common methods that's being used. Uh, so Xuan, I talk about complex networks. So complex network is a uh, in fact, a big area in uh, complexity science because it is um, something that captures many of the accents. So here itself, I show a social complex network. Uh, complex network is like a graph. You have nodes and then you have links. Each node can represent different things. It, here itself, you represent people. Okay? But it can also represent, for example, protein. The node can also pre represent, for example, uh, uh, maybe a computer, okay? So the computer can link together to form a computer network. The protein can link together to form a protein network. And here itself, the human link together to form a social network. So therefore, complex network is, in that sense, um, very general, okay? Um, and then there is something called the topology. It means it depends on how the nodes are linked to each other. Of course, all the nodes can link to every one of the others. So this is called a complete network, which uh, mathematicians have been studying it all along, all the time. 
But it is only very much recently that we know that there's data. Because, well, in this century, we have uh, it's a data revolution. So they collect a lot of data. So especially Facebook, Twitter, and so, so forth. This social data suddenly become possible. And therefore, a uh, researcher has to make use of this social data and then plot networks from this social data. So they know, oh, friends, right? Because in Facebook, this, your, this is your friend. They can use, oh, this person A, friend with person B, C, D, and they can just keep using all this data and suddenly plot this network, which is huge, okay? Which is nice because when it's huge, then it becomes statistically significant, right? So things are not, yeah. So this, in statistic sense, it is now significant. And they, when they do that, they saw that, well, they, the, the degree of these nodes means that Degree means that each node have a certain link. They count the number of links. This node maybe have 20 links, right? That node has only one link. So they plot a distribution of this number of links in the histogram. And amazingly, they found that the link distribution is a power law, invariably. So it's interesting, yeah. Therefore, power law appears and it's called skill-free network. And they try to explain this, and the explanation is preferential attachment. What it means is that when uh, a node is, have a lot of link, a new person come would like to link to that one. So it means a richer get richer type of phenomena. Yeah. So that is preferential attachment, and that comes along with skill-free behavior. So social networks have a lot of this skill-free behavior. And one of the earlier study of um, complex network, small world network, the sixth degree of um, path, right? So you are amazingly, sometimes you say, oh, uh, you say, oh, uh, I, I know your friend, which is my classmate or something. And you see that, oh, it, it's a small world, you say that. And uh, Milgram actually performed this study where he mailed uh, yeah, a letter and from there he actually collect uh, study and realized actually indeed Many of these social uh, interactions sometimes can be a small world. So this small world network is another topology. And the next topology is very common is network with community structure. So means that this red community is very integrated uh, versus the blue one is also integrated, but they are not integrated be be between them. So there is a lot of, some sort of segregation. So in, in a lot of social study, that this is also very important because they study segregation in society yeah, using complex network. So you can see that complex network is a very, very useful tool in, in studying this and help to capture many, many of the phenomena they observe in the social world, uh, actually in other, other disciplines as well. The next important tool and uh, method approach is Agent-based model. Yeah. Agent-based model is a, actually a computational model, right? Where you actually have, have a lot of agents um, that interact with each other through some topology, um, and as a result of this interaction, there's some sort of uh, behavioral uh, outcome uh, through the interaction. So there is some sort of emergence that can actually happen when you perform agent-based simulation. Uh, Basically, the agent-based model consists of agents that can be specified for skills, means there's heterogeneity. It need not be one type of agent. It can be different, different type of agents. Um, and there are decisions made by the agents that can be based on some heuristics. And then the agents can learn and also adapt, all right? And interactive topology like this. So there's some network or social network that can uh, happen between them, and there's environment. So here itself, I just show one example of a type of agent-based model. This is a uh, bus network type of uh, agent-based model, where you can see that the buses are agent, the cars are also agent, the people that is going to em embark the bus and coming down from the bus are all agents. So the agents are heterogeneous. And then you can simulate it, yeah. So, so here itself, you see complex system actually has evolved. Why I say that is because if Traditionally, before computational become very important, there's already mathematics to talk about complex system. That is basically like partial differential equation uh, in physics. So there's fluid mechanics and things like that. So, well, people can describe uh, many of the 
the science of it, but it's only with the computation that now uh, and also data that comes in that we can start to construct networks and agent-based model to study uh, complexity. So that is how computation is also very, very important uh, in the growth of this area. Okay. Right. So with that introduction, uh, I'm now going to um, illustrate through uh, two projects two project that I've done uh, to demonstrate how uh, the complexity science I talked about can be useful uh, for the purpose of um, as, as a form of methods and also models for some purpose. So in this case, it is uh, SERR multiplex network model where we try to use, create this model um, to make prediction and projection on how it, it can be beneficial to maybe simulate and um, the progression of the epidemic and well, if let's say some policymaker is making use of it, how they can perform intervention study uh, or scenario study with it so as to maybe make policy uh, on it. Yeah. So, um, so this is a project we studied, Ms. Uh, Ning Chong and myself. Uh, we work on this in the year, uh, yeah, during the period of the COVID-19. And we actually augment the standards SERR model, which is used to uh, study epidemic, epidemic spreading with um, an agent-based model plus a complex network. So here itself, we model the social interaction uh, with a multiplex and also a temporal complex network where we have a household network, a dormitory network, a workplace network, uh, temporal crowd network and temporal social gathering network and we perform model calibration with real-world data, and then we study on the dynamics of epidemic spreading with some effective reproduction number, RET. But before I go on to talk about this, I want to put this into perspective with what I talk about in the sense of an urban system. Why uh, epidemic spreading model is very much related to the urban uh, complex system that I, I have been talking about. Now, here itself, this is Singapore. Singapore is in the... Uh, in, it's, an urban, it's a city, it's an urban setting, right? And actually, here itself, when we study the virus, the COVID-19, it is basically just a, like a tag of showing how we actually interact with each other, right? Because how we interact with each other actually sometimes is very subtle. Uh, and the fact that the presence of the virus actually is like a tag telling us how we interact with each other. Um, for example, right, now we are in this room. So if I have, I mean, yeah, touch wood, I'm, I don't have, yeah, I have a COVID-19, yeah. So I, yeah, that, that, that means that we are actually, because we are close enough, interacting with each other, that this is spreading, right? So therefore, the virus actually is sort of like a, a marker, right? So I, I find that it's interesting because for a city, when we study, it is how we human interact with the urban environment, the built environment, right? So we are actually now interacting with the built environment because we are in this built environment that's enclosed, right? And we are interacting between ourselves and also with it, yeah. And then the COVID virus actually is like a marker in that sense. And, and that is where you see that built environment could be a house. The built environment can be a dormitory. The milk environment is a workplace, right? And also crowd network here, it, later you see that it is Maybe the transport, because we need to take transport, you go to crowded places, maybe you go and buy food and things like that. And social gathering, yeah, this is a social gathering, yeah, like a conference and things like that. So, therefore, while this work is done in the sense of epidemic, I think it's important to also look at it from the sense of human interaction and human and built environment interaction and how, uh, yeah, we are actually trying to moderate. So, let, let me just recap a bit of background, which I believe all of you still have maybe remembrance of it. So the Wuhan uh, was the first that detected the, the virus in the December 2019, right? And very fast, Singapore got it in the January when someone come from China. I think it's sometime in January. So, um, and for sure, you can see from this curve, this is the imported case. This is the dorm residence. This is the community we have, and this is the total. You can see that actually 
yeah, Singapore actually is very much um, get by the imported cases, and that is where it starts, right? Um, and uh, just to keep make the numbers uh, uh, clear, in fact, uh, many of our Singapore cases, yeah, due to the government good control, uh, is actually in the community is very much uh, no, number is not huge, but the dormitory one is the one that is very very large. So there was some gap that was missed. Yeah. So therefore, the spreading happened a lot in like a wildfire in the dorm, right? Yeah. So therefore, later the, the numbers in, in that sense, in a way, in terms of percentage, like 95% is in the dorm, about 4% is in the uh, community, and about 1% is imported. So that is the, the order of magnitude of this spreading. So first, let me, before I go on to the other modeling, is let, let me just introduce this SEIR model. Um, it's a model that is used a lot in uh, epidemic. First, there's what I call the fourth co compartment, susceptible compartment, exposed compartment, infectious compartment, and recovered compartment. So in this susceptible compartment, we have all agents that are susceptible, right? like all of us are susceptible to COVID-19. And if let's say one is infected, right, then if a susceptible individual come in contact with this infected uh, individual, then that susceptible individual become exposed. Okay? And that exposure is, that is not like every time you can touch with an infected person, you will get it 100%. There's some probability P we call it that you can get it. But if let's say you get it, right, then you become exposed. That's what we mean by exposed. Then, then it will take a number of days, TE days, before this exposed individual becomes infectious. Now, this number of days actually uh, can vary. Some, some people may take it uh, long, some take it short. Yeah. Uh, for COVID, it's about four days. Yeah. For, I mean, the early variant. But now, I don't know. I never kept track of uh, this variant, how many days. But, uh, so, four days, but we provide some sort of distribution, which is a gamma distributed uh, distribution for th this number of days. Then, after it becomes infectious, then the, the individual now can start spreading to others. When exposed, this person is not infectious, so he, he will not able to spread. Oh. But once he becomes infectious, he starts to spread, um, and it, it's spreading for a number of days as well. Uh, TI days, which we call it gamma distributed as well. And after that, he, become, he recovered. Okay? So our assumption is that after he recovered, he's no longer infectious and no longer susceptible. But of course, this is not true. We know COVID-19, you can um, happen again. But in our case, we just assume that yeah, it's removed. Okay, but there are other models that um, S E I S. So, so, so there is also other models that are like that, but we didn't adopt that one. We adopt the S E I R. Yeah, okay. And after that, we augment that. So that is the the new thing that we do to augment it. Why we augment it is because you see, a model is like a replication. It's like an imitation. So for Singapore, uh, it has its own context. So Singapore has this dormitory network. So if I want to use it in some other country, then this multiplex network will be different. It will be in that country's context. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this multiplex network is also shown in C1. It's called multigraph. So here I, we call it multiplex network. It's the same, actually same. So first we have this household network where yeah, there's social interaction among family members. So especially family members is uh, have a small network of number of people, like maybe four or five individuals. So there's different family, different size. So we do have uh, a model for that, uh, make, making sure that the distribution is um, consistent with Singapore context. Um, then there is this dormitory network, which model after the dormitory situation in Singapore. Now this network is actually consists of a community that is much bigger because the workers actually live in a dorm they have chance to interact with many, many more people, right? Yeah. So this dormitory network is like that. And these two networks actually also link to this workplace network because the household members can actually go to workplace, right? So therefore, yeah, in this case, there could be convergence between the dormitory people and the family people, actually, in this workplace network. So again, this workplace network is some sort of community structure for the workplace. Yeah. So this here itself is a complex network together with agent base, sort of simulation. 
And next, we also need to model the crowd. Means that when people actually go to the, take the bus, take the train, these are transient network. Means every day will be different. So that, that's why you see time one, time two, time three. You see the link are all different. So these are um, short-term interactions among random group of individuals each day, right? Um, and therefore, the probability of spreading is also assumed smaller. So therefore, if let's say there's some probability P for spreading for family members uh, or dormitory, here itself, we reduce that, that interaction by 10%. It's 0.1 P, actually, because the, the short-term interaction. Yeah. But the social gathering networks here, which actually, uh, yeah, the, the chance of spreading is not as, yeah, so the, 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 the mechanism is different. So that's why we need to moderate. So social gathering network, because there's more intense interaction, so the spreading probably is still P. We are. But then the network topology here, we model as skill-free network, because it's normally like a social network. Right? Yeah, so this is a skill-free network type of topology. So with all this type of network modeling, together with the SER model, that forms what we call uh, some sort of uh, Monte Carlo type of uh, um, sampling type of multiplex network plus SER model. So this is a bit like a, a mathematical description of it, um, where S, E, I, R here, it is, all these are the probability of being susceptible, exposed, infected, and removed. And the infection um, is affected by sigma and recovered by gamma. These are parameters. Yeah. So this AIJ here are the agency matrix of this complex network. Um, here, the AIJ is for the family, the dormitory, and the workplace, and AIG. AIJG is for the social gathering, and AIJC is for the, um, the crowd. Yeah. So this is basically an augmented model from the basic SER model. So our model actually tried to emulate a different form of real-world social interactions. And the purpose is to examine effectiveness of various intervention strategies against the spreading of COVID-19. Um, so we actually need to tweak the social interactions in our mathematical model uh, so that we can examine and find ways to curb the accelerated types of epidemic spreading so as to provide insights on appropriate exit strategies from lockdown measures as the pandemic is entering the deceleration phase. So this is what happened during that time when we work on this. In fact, we, we're trying to actually also look through the news and hand in hand to understand how, when the government makes use of some of those exit strategies, whether this model can be helpful in that sense. Um, and one thing I'd like to emphasize also before I go on is, once we construct the model, we have all these uh, parameters just now, right? all these various parameters. Actually, we need to uh, calibrate with the data. So that, that's very important because um, so we calibrate the data to make sure that what we have is actually matched to the empirical data. Okay, so therefore, let, let's us show the result, uh, the simulation result that we have. So this result here is for the period 21st January 2020 to 30 May 2020. So, yeah. So this is like the, the one of the early phase of the spreading of the epidemic. So in our modeling, we select uh, empty individuals uniformly uh, at each simulated day T to model this empty number of imported cases. So these are the imported cases that start this uh, uh, agent-based simulation. And here itself, we try to fit to the data in the sense that for 50 realizations that we simulated, we take 20% that is best fit with the epidemic curve that we select. So that's a way of uh, do the calibration. And we do choose the values, parameters values judiciously and calibrate the real data. And we actually perform agent-based simulation for 2, 000, 2 million uh, people, 2 million people. And the dormitory is 110,000 uh, people. Right. And this is the result we have. Um, so let me, exp let me describe the result. So first, I think uh, the first curve to look at is this Orange curve, SERR model, total, the orange one. Um, 
Yeah. So this is the, the orange one is the simulated, and the black one, SG COVID-19 total, this is the actual one. So therefore, we calibrate so that you see the simulator and the black actually match. Yeah. And next is that, now, we have to specially plot this, uh, this inset because, as I mentioned, the dormitory is the one that has a lot. The community actually has few. So this inset is the community one. Right? You see that it's relatively much smaller than the, the black and the orange. So here itself, we put it in the inset. Um, you see that the community one from the data is blue, and then the green one is from the simulation. So again, it's match. Yeah. Now, next is that we know that all this match one comes from the government did something, right? They do circuit breaker. At that time we are, yeah, we are under the circuit breaker. Now, what if the government did not have circuit breaker? So this is something that we can do, but the government cannot do, right? So the simulation allows us to take away the circuit breaker and see what happened. And you see that this is the record. So if the government did not have the circuit breaker, the spread will be like this. For the total, and this is for the community. Okay, so that is the strength of a agent-based model where you can perform what-if scenario uh, and test out cases and before you can make this. So this is one value of it. And after we do that, I mean, the early time, then we know that the, the, the epidemics progresses. So the government is actually trying to, uh, actually later on, in later phase, you know that you want to lift the circuit breaker, right? There's some gradual lifting of the circuit breaker. So we want to see uh, what happened, right? If you do the gradual lifting. If you do the gradual lifting versus not doing the gradual lifting. So here itself are the parameters we set uh, with regards to the uh, gradual lifting. So first, the uh, infectious probability, we always set to 0.1, where this, in the crowd, we reduce it by 10%. Exposed time is about four days. Infectious time is about two days. Yeah. Um, and population, as mentioned, is 2 million. Employment rate, yeah, Singapore uh, employment rate is about 45%. Uh, but when it is during that period, uh, uh, lockdown is about 15% are essential workers. Yeah. Uh, population stay in dormitories is 110,000. Yeah. Uh, intra dormitory connections, so yes, so it is about 60. Means the people in the dormitory actually connect about, the number is about 60. Um, but during circuit breaker, uh, it's reduced by 25% every five days during circuit breaker until there are 25% left. So during circuit breaker, at the time you, you try to have less and less and less uh, this uh, interaction. You don't do it immediately, uh, but you reduce it um, step by step. So uh, inter dormitory connections is, yeah, yeah, during circuit breaker, we totally cut off, no, no, no such connection. Um, every size of household is 2.5, intra-household connection probably 0.95, inter-household, yeah, because there can be visit between household is about 0.4 and reduce to 5% during circuit breaker. Every size of workplaces is about 4, uh, intra-workplace connection probably is 0.7, inter-workplace connection probably 0 0.08, yeah. And social gathering, we always, we model it about a group of 400 people and um, miss 400 nodes and there's uh, no, 400 groups, and uh, each group is about 50, yeah. And this is a social gathering, so the degree is 8. Yeah. For crowd, there's about 1,000, yeah, of groups and 50 for each, yeah. So this is the parameters we use, uh, yeah, I, I think this, yeah, here, here is the parameter we use for the circuit breaker. So I'm sorry, I, it's not the gradual lifting, so it's for the circuit break. Right, okay. So later on, the next part, I'm going to show um, the effect of this thing called the effective reproduction number. Um, you have heard of, of this, right, in the news, say how government uses to, to determine maybe how to um, make decisions. Yeah. So normally, the, uh, the, the way it was done is through this daily number of new cases, right? It's a set of numbers, like daily. Today got N0, people got infected, N1 and N2 and N. And. So in the case of COVID, because there's exposed period, so the generation is cohort. So we have this N0 and this sum of 
uh, t equal to one to t means exposed time. This total number is that cohort of uh, individuals that got uh, um, yeah, ex exposed to it and so on and so forth. So therefore, with this number, then we do what you call the dynamical reproduction number. Um, so this comes from some branching process estimator that we use. The idea here, in fact, is I think it's important. Later you see that we actually use a lot of this type of numbers. This, these are indices. What, what I mean is that uh, I would call this some sort of collective variable. Because when you do a complex system, right? So how do you try to get meaning out of something? You need to quantify something. So therefore, there are some indices. And this reproduction number is the def definition of these indices actually turns out to be very fruitful. Um, yeah, so I, I, I believe this is one aspect of how we develop uh, methods, models, and theory that we need to somehow know how to define some of this sort of collective variable. Yeah. So this reproduction number is very useful, which we know that if let's say it's, it's one, it's, it's the borderline. If less than one, it's good because things will go down, um, it's decelerate, but if greater than one, it will like, explode. Yeah. So that, that is the, the value of the number. So we simulate this with our circuit breaker for the red and with circuit breaker for the orange. Yeah. So again, right, the, this red one is something that uh, the agent-based model can do, but the real world cannot. Um, so first, let's recap. There, there are three waves that you may remember. The first wave is on 14th of February, uh, which is an infection cluster at the Church of Grace Assembly of God. Which is this small little one you see here? This little one, a private function at Safra Jurong, okay, which is this small little one. Then it's the circulation of COVID nineteen within the dormitories of the foreign workers, the huge one. So these are the wave. You see that it is above one for the dynamical reproduction number. So that number is very important because that number captures for you the, the wave of yeah, and the wave would be bigger if let's say there's no circuit break. And yeah, so this is the part where we talk about the gradual lifting of control measure. So with those that later on the government want, let's say, have this gradual lifting. So we can also simulate. In the same way, you see the black one is the, is the real data. Uh, the blue one is for the real data for the community. And the orange one right, is the one that is come from the simulation. Um, the green one is also is for the community. And the red and the purple one is the one with out the gradual lifting. Now, the real data is up to here. So we predict based on our agent based model what would happen beyond that at that point of our research. Yeah. Now, now it's already passed. Yeah. So we can see again that if there's no gradual lifting, how bad it, it could be. And also importantly, you see that here with the uh, gradual lifting, you see that this part here, yeah, there is not like a, a big wave, just a small little dip. Without gradual lifting, you see that this is like a big wave. So therefore, uh, it's important yeah, uh, to, to, to understand the effectiveness of this gradual lifting. So in summary, uh, here we talk about an SERR model come multiplex network to study early phase of evolution of COVID-19 pandemic in Singapore. Um, so we can see that the dynamical reproduction number provide uh, good measure to examine whether, well, maybe some control measures is effective or not. So next, yeah, the next project that I'm going to talk about uh, is related to urban planning and urban modeling. Uh, so just now I talked about household um, and workplace, right? So there's one aspect of city. Um, in city, you talk about you know, people actually interacting and go to work. But there is another thing that I learned uh, is that there is also interaction between firms. So this is another project that I understand. Firms uh, is also one very important aspect of uh, city. So here is in this project, so you try to ask a few key questions. What are the special patterns and characteristics of firms within a specific industry? What are the special relationship between subsectors of the firm? Can we infer special relationship with functional properties of the firms? Are there interesting behavior patterns that emerge out of the spatial data? So basically, we know that firms actually locate in different parts of the city. And here lies the question of spatial interaction. 
which you heard a lot in the urban uh, um, science in terms of uh, that actually in the city, um, social interaction is one of the key uh, important factors. So we study this in social interaction through the marine time industry, which actually consists of shipping, port, marine time services, right, which are basically supporting services for the ships, and also offshore marine engineering, right, which can talk about shipbuilding, ship repair, and marine engineering, marine equipment. So here is a spatial overview of the marine time industry in Singapore with 40 subsectors. Um, you can see that many of them actually uh, lie in the south and west of Singapore. Um, yeah, fewer in the north and the east. Yeah. So, um, so we yeah. So here itself again, uh, we want to study it uh, systematically. So this is the type of collective variable I talked about just now. So we use something like percolation uh, to study how the firms agglomerate uh, together. So, so let me just quickly describe to you. So what happens means agglomeration means how firms actually cluster together. So this clustering depends on the uh, certain distance d. Yeah. So it, this, this d actually increases. So when d is very small, um, yeah, we cluster each firm individually. But as we increase d, you see these two firms lie within this D, then it become one cluster. And you increase D some more, now this firm, the interdistance between these two firms become within this D2, so we can cluster them together. But the distance between this one and this one is still um, not, yeah, so this is still smaller than the, unless this D2 is large enough to encapsulate, otherwise we cannot cluster these two together. So this D is the one that determines which firms are clustered. So therefore, if this D becomes larger, large, large enough to uh, span this distance here, then we can cluster these two together. So we keep increasing. Uh, and based on the D, we cluster them. So of course, eventually, you increase to some size D, that everything clusters together. So that is how the, the cluster forms and percolate. Um, so for some particular distance D, right, we can actually give a number to the agglomeration. So at this um, this size of D, maybe within this, this length scale, too small, then this become one cluster, this another cluster. And so here itself, we, we calculate the frequency. Means there's out of this number of points, the, this number of points are 0 0.9, then the rest is maybe 0 0.0, uh, 0.1 divided by, so the rest will be 0 0.1, right? 0 0.1 divided by 4, to form each of these. So therefore, you we calculate this um, alpha, which is the sum of this uh, square of each of this frequency. So the, the sum of this frequency should sum to one. So these are like probability. So you see that these are very small, right? Point 0.1 divided by four, that's like 0 0.025. So the square even smaller. So it's essentially like 0 0.81 for this one. And this is similarly, you, you can calculate the agglomeration from this same perspective is 0.5 and so, so forth. So you see that this, gives you some sort of cluster. You see that this is, intuitively, this is, of course, more clustered than this one. This is like dispersed, right? So this number actually provides some sort of indication how agglomerate is the, the, the points are. So here itself, I just quickly show a video of this. Um, when you increase the clusters, the distance, you see that the, the clusters start at this place, which is the... CBD. Yeah, means many, many firms actually locate in CBD. They are very close. The clusters start there. And some are also very close and start to form at those other regions. But as the distance increases, of course, more and more cluster together. And important point is that there's this part here that uh, form bigger clusters. And these are actually the marine time sector. They tend to locate to the west, which is actually understandable because yeah, that, that is the place where uh, the ports are. Okay. So here we can actually um, determine the agglomeration of each of the 40 subsectors. Yeah. And yeah, some of them, like marine time security, they are not agglomerated at all. You see 0.1437. But law firms, 
they are very much agglomerated. They are at the CBD. Yeah. So there's another way to compute uh, spatial uh, relationship. That's what we call it, spatial co-occurrence. How firms of two subsectors actually like to cite with respect to each other. So are we able to measure that, uh, the spatial relationship between them? So we propose this measure called the spatial co-occurrence. So how we do it is that, first the space we divide into grid. So this is for subsector A, subsector B. Then in this grid, um, we again get the frequency. So that you see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten points, right? So all these ten points, 20% is here. So 0 0.2, 0 here and 0 0.1. So therefore we form this number here. Similarly, for the other subsector, we form the, this uh, number similarly. And then we find its correlation. And that correlation will tell us the co-occurrence. So that's a simple way to determine this number. And after that, based on that number, we do hierarchical clustering. So this is a the heat map of that number between each other. You see this is between 33 and uh, 20, right? So we get a number for the co-occurrence. So it's always not, not with itself, it's but with the other party. So we, uh, we got the number, then we do hierarchical clustering um, and order them in, in a heat map. Now this would then very efficiently tell us which subsector actually co-locate with other subsector. So let me illustrate to you. So here, you see this one, green, right? The, ice, the red one means that they are not uh, co-occur. Means 21 co-occur with uh, 34, right? But 21 does, do not co-occur with the rest. So it's like 21 like 34, okay? But not the rest. Similarly for 34. And you see this is the, the one that we found. You see, they, they, indeed, they, they more, more or less side close to each other. And then we look at the subsector. It is marine and offshore engineering and shipbuilder and repairer. So somehow these two firms like to be together, side close to each other. Yeah. So the data actually tells us this. So this is another one. Here is uh, bunker surveyor co occur with ship surveying with co occurrence 0.84. So these two also like to side close to each other. And this one, now not two, but three. So these three firms, law firms, finance, and law firms actually co occur with high, very high co occurrence. And these are ship owners and operators, ship agencies, and ship management. Also very high co occurrence. And last one, insurance, accounting service, media, public relations, high co occurrence. So, yeah. so this collective variable allows us to actually retrieve yeah, the number. Okay, so we also can obtain following index, like which firms follow which other firms. So the way we compute it will be based on, yeah, uh, when we see two firms that are uh, close together, we form a circle. So here itself, um, if like A is the base line, then we form a circle around A and see, oh, this is within it. Yeah, so we, we count and then we got this number. So I need to go a bit fast because I left 10 minutes. So I will not be able to describe to detail. Yeah. So quickly, I, I give you a key idea. Yeah. So uh, this following is, for example, we, we realize that recruitment agency follow industry organization associate. You see like this one, 28. This. And then you see that indeed, yeah, there's some following. And here itself, uh, recruitment agency follow industry. So we define this variable, uh, quality variable, to actually sieve out this spatial relationship information between firms. So our result here show that some sectors are space agnostic, right? Uh, while other sectors are often found near other businesses. So some are like a loner, but some like to co-locate with others. So these are the firms that I showed just now. And also agglomeration effect is more apparent in central area where technical services tend to locate, right? Um, yeah. So this, this is a summary. So I, I think I just skip it. Yeah, I, I just I talked about it just now. So what I have just now is basically spatial relationship. But in city, there's also temporal relationship. So the next slide, I'm going to just talk about, next few slides, just talk about how we also use this collective variable to determine this sort of temporal relationship. So we use something called a region index, where we actually determine um, 
fraction of so there is a fraction of all firms in this so we are interested in for example the central area the CBD how firms actually like to locate within CBD certain firms like to locate in CBD so if a uh, fraction of A type firms in central area is FA versus over F0 means fraction of all firms uh, of a particular type in this same region this CA index or central area index would give us a clue on which uh, firms like to locate in the central area so we test it in this whole list of different uh, sectors and using that index we found that information and communications finance and insurance activities real estate activities professional scientific and technical activities are positive means that they specifically like to locate themselves in the central area And interestingly, we see that now here is a temporal part. With that, actually, we can see as the year goes, 2009, 2013, 2019, there are certain sectors that consistently decrease, means that they move away from the CBD consistently. Yeah, you see, 2009, then it becomes lesser, lesser. So some of the firms are like venture capital, data entry services, management self-owned states, development of software, web portals, accounting, auditing services, development of e-commerce, development of computer games, other information technology. So you see it's like IT services and things like that. They move away. But there are other firms that concentrate, means that they start to go into the CBD as year goes. And you can see, actually you scrutinize, there are a lot of the finance and commercial firms yeah, go in. Yeah. Finance, uh, wholesale bank, treasury centers, captive, captive insurance, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, okay, so, yeah. So, therefore, we, we, we see that this index helps us to determine that. And in fact, here is a plot of what happens. So, original count of wholesale bank is there. As the year goes, you see that this is a change, right, from 2009, 2013, 2013, 2013. So, the change is all there. So, very few in other places. So, wholesale bank just consent focus on locating themselves in the CBD. Yeah. But however, there are some that move out. So here, this is when they are in the CBD, they move out. So accounting and auditing services right, is one of them. Yeah. So from this blue one is where they are in 2009. But 2009 and 2013, actually this is the, the shift. They shift out from the CBD uh, into the other areas like Tampanese and Woodlands. Right? So the change in count in this planning area. So this is spatial co-occurrence I talked about just now, so I'm not going to repeat. So I, I just put it here to remind. So therefore, we can also perform this sort of co-occurrence network, uh, co-occurrence heat map, right? Just like do a heat map. But here itself, we, from the heat map, we can also form a complex network of that heat map. So you form a complex network, you see that, we see that there are firms, right, that are, like to co-locate each other. These are like cluster one, uh, cluster two here, actually the finance and insurance activities, or the construction site, we also like to cluster together uh, within the same site. But there are also mixed area, um, like wholesale, professional, scientific, technical activities, they also like to co-locate. But the interesting thing would be co-change. Well, they turn firms like to co-locate, but they also like to change together. So can we find firms that are like that? So that is our purpose for the next few slides. So if we just start to find core change itself, it is very complicated like this. But now we want to find those that core change and co-locate together. It is a subset of this map. Yeah. So in the core change, you see that there's a lot of this orange one here, but yeah, so a lot of them are consultancy services. So when we form the core change co-occur network, uh, here itself this consultancy uh, sector is still there, but we start to also see construction, um, so other wholesale and education and retail services. So these are sectors that somehow like to co-locate together and also when they change, they co-change together. So here we show a clear example of a co-occur and co-change. You see, this one is actually uh, renovation, contractors and electrical works. You see the, the, 
the, the pattern is very, very similar, right? They co-occur together in all these different planning areas. But when code change, you see the code change is also very similar. So somehow they like to change together, which we do not understand why, but just, just from the data. So, um, right. So basically here is an insight that we gain from it. So there are certain firms that are sticky to a central area, like information and comm, finance and insurance activities, real estate, and professional and scientific technical activities. And co-occur and co-change, well, uh, we see that uh, IT business, consultancy, advertising agency, design, and construction sectors, they like to co-occur. Uh, these firms are also observed to co-change. And construction sector firms are actually quite distinct. Um, and they may be co-locate and co-change because of maybe top-down planning. So they, their pattern could be quite different from the IT, advertising, design, and services. So we believe this diversity and dense connection of co-occurrence and co-change network results from some sort of spatial interaction shaped by geography and land use planning, where top-down and bottom-up effects both play in their formation. So this analysis of spatial temporal dynamics of firm let us understand that certain locations are maybe more or less attractive for certain sectors over time, and certain firms actually are maybe not so concerned that they are actually maybe more or less space agnostic. So the next phase we like to do is, well, you see I'm studying methods here. I'm not talking about model yet for, for this part. Right? So, uh, so therefore, well, how do we understand locational preference and land use requirement of firms? So this is, have, haven't understand yet, we see data which we cannot explain. So therefore, the next thing will be to lead to some sort of study, right? The, which is what we call the land use and transportation interaction model, uh, which whatever we study here could be some sort of appropriate attribute factors for that. So that's a follow on, follow on word. So uh, this is uh, my second last slide. Hopefully I'm in time. So the model that I talk about this phase, actually is the land use and transportation interaction model. So it, currently there are already such model uh, being used. For example, urban sim, this is a micro simulation model uh, acti activity base, uh, and actually here itself is, for example, it predicts increase in the number of households in Brussels in the period of 2001 and 2008. Um, there's also another one, which is Delta, right? It shows how by increasing road capacity, uh, actually there could be a change in distribution of employment uh, within, the, within the city itself. So what is looting model? Looting model is some sort of land use sub-model and transportation sub-model. So you have two, these two models actually interact with each other. Uh, and land use sub-model adopts what we call discrete choice model, and transportation sub-model use some sort of four-step transport model, but there could be other approach. So whatever we study previously, the prior study, somehow allow us to understand a bit more of the intrinsic factors and correlation of firms in Singapore. So how would this correlation be useful when we put it into the LUTI model? So that is something to be explored in future. So last, last slide. Um, so conclusion is to apply complexity science to urban system. Um, to, there's a need to develop methods and models to represent complex system of interest. Methods together with the definition of collective variables provide a scaffold to the constructed model. Models serve to replicate and approximate actual complex system where they serve the purpose of answering what if scenarios and perform intervention studies. So for example, the LUTI model is one aspect. So imagine that we can use it to ask what if scenario and also intervention study for, for, for example, for prediction and projection of future scenarios, and also for planning and policy making purpose. So hopefully this gives you a, some sort of a sense of how complexity science can be useful for urban system planning and projection. So that's all, thank you very much for your attention. I, I don't know whether I have time for a question. Maybe it's just in time for. Yeah. So I have uh, two questions. One is regarding the second study. So uh, regarding the second study, yeah. So regarding the second study, how does your choice of grid size affect the choice of what? Choice choice of what? Grid size. Grid size. How does the choice of grid size affect your co-occurrence matrix? 
Uh, okay, choice or what again? Yeah. Grid, grid size, because you constructed grids, right? Oh, grid, yeah, grid size, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, because my hearing not so good, so sometimes, yeah, it's not your fault, yeah. Okay, so the question is, uh, when I do my co-occurrence, I use a, a grid, yeah. So actually, in our case, we actually try different grid, not just one grid size. So we, we do it across a, a set of grid, and then after that, we average out. So that's how we do it. Yeah. So let's say if I try to implement your method for another city, like how do I systematically determine? Like, or is it like heuristics like based on the data? Yeah. So, uh, so basically, we increase the grid size maybe in, in steps, maybe 50 meters, uh, or maybe in, kilometers. So we basically explore. We try and then we look at the effect uh, after we do it. Because we can always, after we do it, right, then we have a heat map, then we can immediately extract out the, the consequence. And we can see whether it's effective or not. Yeah. So that's how we do it. Thank you. Then uh, my next question is about your first study, the scientific reports paper. So do you take into account uh, the population distribution for your Asian-based model. Hmm. Yeah, so the population distribution for the epidemic spreading part, right? Yeah, okay. So um, I think we basically did not uh, model it from the census data because the census would have all the distribution. Yeah. So uh, we, we basically just do it globally in a sense. Yeah. So we, we didn't put it into like a planning area, yeah, like uh, how, how many people in Chua Chukang and so on and so forth, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. So I've got two questions on the implementation of the first model. So the first one is regarding the calibration of the first model, uh, be it like the normal simulation or the later the counter, uh, the counter petrol check. Okay. So I want to ask on this, how do we derive certain value for certain parameters? Certain value are very easy, like the inflation rate or can percent this thing. But certain things like the intra dormitory link, those kind of things, I mean, the distribution, we can take it from the future, but the value, how do we come up with yeah. Okay, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. So we actually uh, do it in various ways. Um, one way, in fact, we try to uh, look from the news report or whatever. Uh, but of course, we also try and error. So there, there are, um, because in, in some sense, we, um, we got the data, data, the data is available in the, uh, the web. So we know the data. So from there, we do, try and do some try and error in some sense. Yeah. Then the other way is, can you give us a sense of the amount of computation required, like for instance, uh, just for one times the simulation of the first model. So uh, how long does it need and do you need to send it to NTU's high performing computing or do you just can do it using Fortune or C or just MATLAB for a local terminal? You know, I, I just I just want to because it's simulated to 2 million. <laughs> and then, yeah, I just, want, I just want to have a sense of the amount of computing that we are thinking. Uh, amount of computing required, right? That's your question. Yeah. Yeah. So No, we, we didn't use the, um, we do, do not need to have that uh, high amount of computer power. Of course, it doesn't calculate like instantaneously or so, maybe one to one day plus, maybe around that order, yeah. But do you use uh, parallel computing? No, no, I did. we didn't use parallel computing. Uh, it's in a local uh, station. Yeah, local station. Then, uh, do, you, do you use Fortune or not? Fortune or you use? Uh, Python. We use Python. Python. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, what affect the result again? Uh, the grid size, that means uh, your coverage area, oh, when okay. you do assessment for heat map, etc. Mm. Mm. I think when you share the second study, yeah. Mm. So we just want to get some sensing from the second study that you have done. Uh, what was the grid size that you all would recommend for such studies in terms of the distribution, spatial distributions of the different 
uh, industry uh, or the different industry of uh, developments, etc. Mm. Okay, so the grid size, right? Mm. Yeah, the grid size, I think, if I'm not wrong, is one kilo. So what? So okay, Ning 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 is the the other oh. the other person who works on this. Oh, okay, so Maybe she, okay. so for the normal usually uh normal study right, we, you can study in different country like UK or whatever. <coughs> usually there is a method. Let's say you have this uh this much of industry right, then um usually we have, uh, one method that you can look at the correlations. Um, uh, there is a metric to quantify it. Uh, um, it will tell you, uh, that metric will tell you that this, this uh, distance is the best, that it's uh, best um, give you that, uh, the, the cluster. So this, this is the best best way to segment the cluster. So, um, but um, for our study, right, um, uh, actually we, we want to uh, look at different pattern, different industry, that's why we want to use different grid size. So ours is, uh, depend on the, let's say Singapore, uh, the, the horizontal, the distance is 5,000. So that's why we try to start with, uh, I think, 50, uh, all the way to 2,000. 2, so we take average, like very small grid size to very large grid size, and then we take the average. But I think in another study, we find that for those uh, commercial shops, uh, the best way to Okay, yeah, this is a good question. I actually, yeah, personally, I was also very curious about this. Yeah. Unfortunately, we, we never do that. So I think the, at that point in time when we do it, we are, we are doing it a bit like trying to predict what is going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when we did that, uh, we see that, okay, so it, it does match. Yeah. But then we know that the matching is also due to some calibration. Yeah. So, of course, then it would be interesting to do it. Okay, so based on this calibration, as time goes, how much it will still match and maybe diverge, right? Yeah, so after that, we didn't. We just like see what if, and then we, then we submit. Yeah, but yeah, good point. So we should, yeah, in future, we can perhaps do, some, do, do back and check. Yeah. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, but it could be interesting also because the, now the variant is also very different. Mm, yeah. So maybe the characteristics are very different. It, it may have evolved. Yeah. yeah. So the model, I believe that you will need to do some adjustment to make it adaptive. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Very good. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Demonstration on the on the complex complex system is very complicated. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I quite like love your last project about the special pattern uh, about firms and funding is very valuable in industrial pl uh, planning. Mm. Like to decide the firm location and also in plan how to decide uh, how many and how various uh, firms can be put together in one cluster. Mm. And I would like to hear more about your thoughts, how this study, uh, the value, uh, the value thing, and, mm, and uh, if this can be replicated or reproduced in other countries. Yeah, mm. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so we, we, we use the indexes to study the spatial relationship between the firms. So I, I believe uh, for sure this can be done. Um, let's say we have data from other countries. Um, we can definitely uh, do it. So I think the, the value of this would be to understand um, why certain sector actually like to co-occur together. Um, 
So this is not able to be done through just an empirical analysis. So there must be some underlying causal factors that, that could be the reason. Only for the marine time one, we able to foresee it because the bunker surveyor uh, uh, and uh, the other one is the ship surveyor. Actually, they, they like to co-locate. Um, of course, I think it's a bit common sense because um, the, the surveyor when want to survey the ship, whether it's safe or not, also survey whether there's a suf sufficient patrol to, to, to go for shipping. So therefore, they co-locate is synergistic. So that's good. Yeah. But for some others, um, looks like very different economically, but they seem still quite robust. So I think the good question you ask is when you go and see other country, this pattern, is it still similar? Uh, if let's say we see that this pattern is also similar there, that must be some very clear uh, underlying causal reason. Yeah. Uh, I'm not so sure whether the Luti model would be able to decipher it because Luti model basically you put in a lot of factors and hopefully through the utility function you can uh, derive something. But uh, may maybe uh, this, this part is something open, so I, I'd like to look more into it. Yeah, thank, thanks for your question. So, if no more question, then uh, that, that's all. Thank, thank you very much for your attention.